I've been coming here a long time, and one of the things I really appreciate about this congregation is that it brings together people who share my passion for social justice. And just last month, there were at least 20 of, of you who helped to make our March on Harrisburg event that occurred where we marched to Harrisburg and demanded that our legislators pass a gift ban so that they cannot take unlimited gifts from lobbyists. And it was an exciting uh, opportunity. Uh, we're still working on that, so, but I'm just grateful to have a community who shares that work. Our congregation mission is one of spiritual transformation of work for a more just and equitable world and of education and engagement of people of all ages. We welcome you here, whether it's your first time with us or you've been with us here for weeks, months or years, and we welcome you in person and we welcome you online. Later in the service, we will share matters of the heart, and you may submit these anytime by going to uucy.org moth if you're joining us on Zoom, or, and type your mat, uh, ideas in the matters of the heart chat. And we invite you to stay at the end of the service for a few announcements. Okay. Thank you, Carol. Good morning, everyone. I'm the Reverend Jen Raffensperger, and I'm proud to serve as the minister of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of York. Good morning on this somewhat damp day. I welcome you all here. And as we prepare to begin worship, I invite you to settle into your bodies. Maybe twitch your arms if you're feeling a little squirmy and get yourself ready for worship, we will hear the bell sounded three times. We now light the chalice, the symbol of our living faith. If you're joining us online, you may wish to light a chalice or a candle at home. And I invite you today to hear the chalice lighting words, The Calling of the Creatures by Reverend Ian Rydell. Come, hoof and trunk and tail and horn and paw and wing and claw, Come bird and reptile, mammal born, all full of nature's law. Bring bark and crow and ribbit too, and silent stare and hiss. Bring your purr and trill and warble too, and voice no ear can miss. We gather here, each life and all, to celebrate and sing to honor creatures large and small. Tis holiness we bring. Now join us in our opening hymn, We Celebrate the Web of Life. Oh, a little challenge for you. Right off. This is a, this is a hymn from the 16th century. I know what you're thinking. It's pretty boring, right? There, now you know it. Now we're going to sing it with a very, very different kind of accompaniment because the words are so full of life and energy. It just didn't feel right to play this one in the style of a 16th century organist. So, get ready. That's the tune. This is how we're gonna sing it. You ready? <laughs> All right, you better be ready. Here we go. We celebrate the web of life, its magnitude we see, for we can see divinity in every living thing. A fragment of the perfect all in cactus and in quail, as much in time. Yeah. 
ancient dreams we live the song our bones link stone to star and find our future worlds to the heroes that were and are respect the water land and air which gave all creatures birth protect the Time for our story for all ages and any of you little people or big people that want to come and sit up here on the rug next to me come on up yeah we've got an animal story today today our theme is our dear friends the animal creatures welcome oh it's so nice to see you all here yes 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 <laughs> you can sit on the chair. <laughs> ah, so lovely to have you. Well, again, my name is Carol, and I have a story today that comes from the Lenny Lenape pe people, and they were the first people or the Native Americans that settled in this part of the world, okay? And so this story is about a very special rainbow bird. Maybe I look a little bit like a rainbow today. I hope so. Even got the purple hair. And, um, and it is, I'm calling forth the story because of the relationship between humans and animals, which we honor today. And also because later in our service, we will honor the Rainbow Rose Center. And in that regard, I have changed some of the pronouns in the story. So the story is called The Sacrifice of the Rainbow Bird. A long, long time ago, when humans and creatures talked to each other, the world was coming into being, and the moon and the stars had settled in the sky, and the uh, seasons were starting to develop, and the first real winter came. And the animals and the humans were confused, and they didn't know what to do, and the birds started to fly south to the warmer places, but they didn't know where to settle. And the mice in the woods, they went around gathering nuts, but they didn't realize they were supposed to hide them. And the bears, well, the bears, they went into hibernation, but they didn't really know how to do it. It was the first time. They kept waking up, and they were cranky. But the ones who really had a hard time were the humans because they didn't have any fur to keep them warm, they didn't have feathers to fly south, and they were dying. And so it was that the oldest person living, he was the great-grandchild of the first man and the first woman, he called a meeting. Gather up, gather up, we have to figure this out. All of the humans are dying, we need your help. Someone has to go to the north wind and tell them to stop blowing so much snow on us. Everyone's dying. Oh, but that was a long way to go. Everyone was afraid. Nobody wanted to go that far. They probably wouldn't make it. And then the rainbow bird came. I'll do it. I'll do it. And she had a voice of great music. Oh, no, 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 not the rainbow bird. She's the most beautiful creature we have. If we lose her, what do we do? I'll do it. I have been called to do this to help my human friends. And so off she took, and she flew, and she flew, and she flew, and she flew for three days and three nights 
until she came to the grand and open house of the north wind. And she was so exhausted when she got there. And the north wind invited her in and brought her and set down some warm milk. And she rested. And then she told her why she had come. I, I, uh, uh, our human friends, they're dying. It's so cold. Can you, can you stop this terrible wind? It's so cold and so snowy. Oh, I can't. I've been called by the supreme being to do this. I must do what the supreme being tells me to do. But I have an idea. Go to the snowmaker. Maybe the snowmaker will make less snow. But it's a long way. It's a long way, I'm just telling you. I'm not gonna, nothing's going to stop me. And off the rainbow bird went on and on and on and on for six days and nights until she came to the palace, the ice palace of the snowmaker. Oh, it was magnificent. Tall turrets and big, grand walls. And the rainbow bird stepped in, and there was the ice maker. She was sitting at her grinding wheel with the snow, and she was grinding the, the ice and turning it into snow. Welcome, she said, but she didn't stop and look. She was so busy making snow. She was so busy making snow. Oh, please, please, can you listen to me? My friends, the humans, they're dying from all the snow. Can't you stop making so much snow? I've been called from the supreme being. This is what I'm supposed to do now this time of the year. Well, maybe you can go to the supreme being. Oh, it's really far. Well, you know, what do you think the rainbow bird did? Took off, right? Off and far, far away for nine days, nine nights, and finally got there. When she got there, she just fell down right at the entrance. She was exhausted. And the supreme being, she came down, and she picked her up and carried her in. And she got her warm and gave her some food. And after the rainbow bird finally had rested and could talk, she told her what she wanted. Ah, uh, I am the supreme being. I cannot change things. When I make an edict, that is the way it is. I cannot stop the snow. I cannot stop the winter. But because of your bravery, I will help the humans. And the supreme being reached down and gave to the rainbow bird a stick, a smoldering stick. Why, the stick had some fire on it. Take this down. Take this down, and I will give fire to the people that will keep them warm in the winter. Well, the rainbow bird was amazed and never seen anything like that. Put the stick in his mouth. Flew day and night day and night, and oh, that fire was burning in his mouth and causing rasping, and, and, and it was so scary, but he kept going, he kept going, and finally when he got there, he fell down. Whew, what is this? It was, it was a big, gigantic black bird with black feet. Well, all that smoke and cinder, it had turned the rainbow bird into something completely different, and they were afraid of it. And the, old, the oldest man in the world came out. Oh, what is this? And he reached down and picked up the stick. And the rainbow bird went to sing. Ah, ah. His voice, his beautiful voice had been lost from all the fire and the smoke. Ah! Oh, look at this. It's making me warm. It will keep us through the winter. Oh, it's the rainbow bird. Thank you for saving all of us. And that is why I'm telling you this story, my friends. If you ever see a big old black crow going, Rah! don't be afraid, because that is the ancestor of the beautiful rainbow bird. Thank you. Now we will sing you out to your classes. Yay! As you go, may joy surround you. As you go, go in peace. Know our love is with you always. As you go, as you go, as you go. Oh, may joy surround you as you go.
reading today is Blessing of the Animals, St. Francis Day by Reverend Thomas Rhodes. You birds of the air, hawk, sparrow, and laughing jay, you embody freedom itself. Delight us with your song, astound us with feats of migration, grant us your perspective, for too often our horizon is limited and we are blind to the full results of our actions. You, worms of the earth, ants, beetles, spiders, and centipedes, you are the essential but oft-forgotten strand on nature's web. Through you the cycle is complete. Through your new life arises from old. Remind us of our humility. For the wheel of life does not turn around us. We are not the axle, but merely spokes, no less than unseen, unknown, and shunned companions such as yourselves. You, creatures of the field and wood and field, marsh and desert, bear and bison, skunk and squirrel, weasel and wolf, too often we have sacrificed your homes in the name of progress, clear-cutting the forest to fill our desire, or covering the earth with tarmac, cement, and suburban lawns. Pray that we may remember that the earth was not given for our needs alone, and what we do to you, we eventually do to ourselves. You animals of the farm, horse and cow, pig and fowl, willingly or not, you give your very lives for us. Your milk for our nourishment, your flesh for our sustenance. Yet too often we forget that the meat on our tables was once alive as we are. Forgive our willing, willful ignorance and remind us constantly to give thanks for your sacrifice. You, dearest companions in our lives, dogs and cats and hamsters and goldfish, you who are with us today and you who always will be present in our memories, you have enriched our lives in so many ways, endured our shortcomings with calm acceptance, taught us something about our humanity, taught us how to love. May we hold you in our hearts throughout the days of our lives. Thank you. I forgot a candle because I wanted to make sure we did this today. I'm going to light a little delayed I'm going to light this candle, which didn't stay lit, but that's cool. We're good. For the lives of all beloved companion animals that are no longer with us, that have enriched our lives. We had a few specific pet losses named in Matters of the Heart a few weeks ago, but I wanted to make sure there was a candle for anyone who has gone through that loss. I have a confession to make. On this Sunday, when we celebrate and bless all the animals that enrich our lives and create the vital energy of our entire planet, I have to tell you that the first time I blessed an animal was not a particularly auspicious occasion. In college, a friend of mine adopted a cat. One weekend evening, as a group of us gathered for yet another semi-raucous party in my friend's apartment, I legally indulged in adult beverages to the point where I felt like I had the best idea ever, which was to baptize my friend's kitten. <laughs> and when I said this out loud, enough of my friends, and most importantly, the friend who had chosen to take responsibility for this young cat's life, they also thought it was a pretty great idea. So we semi-raucously located the kitten, perhaps four or five months old at this point, and not entirely fond of being held still. And we semi-raucously gathered in a cluster around the bathroom where the sink would serve as our baptismal font. 
The kitten was squirmy, but fortunately, baptism doesn't take long if one cuts right to the chase. I cupped a little bit of water in my right hand and held the kitten with my left, and as I said the words of baptism from my Roman Catholic upbringing, I gently dribbled water onto the cat's head. He shook it off quite promptly and squirmed, and I set him down gently, none the worse for wear. Now, I don't tell this story to suggest that anyone should baptize their own pet, at least not the way I did it. The reason this tale is inauspicious, even though it did the cat no harm and he went on to live a good, long, and healthy life, is because I did it as a joke. I used the language of baptism, which is a sacred rite for many people, to get some quick laughs. And because I was joking, I didn't have any sense of what an act of blessing would mean in my own heart. The Roman Catholic rite of baptism uses the language of the Trinity. You baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And it's actually one Catholic sacrament that's permitted to be performed by anyone not an ordained clergy person. Because baptism is required in infancy in the Catholic tradition, all people are empowered to bless in this way so that If a child or infant is in peril, it may have its immortal soul protected in the event of mortal danger. And although I was no longer Catholic when I baptized my friend's cat, I felt some guilt over making a mockery of what can be a truly sacred act. And I have said it before. In our tradition, anyone can bless But I invite us all to consider the state of our hearts, our own hearts, when we are choosing to undertake a blessing. Poet, priest, and mystic John O'Donohue has this to say about blessing. It would be lovely if we could rediscover our power to bless one another. I believe each of us can bless. When a blessing is invoked, it changes the atmosphere. Some of the plenitude flows into our hearts from the invisible neighborhood of loving kindness. In the light and reverence of blessing, a person or situation becomes illuminated in a completely new way. In a dead wall, a new window opens. In dense darkness, a path starts to glimmer And into a broken heart, healing falls like morning dew. It is ironic that so often we continue to live like paupers, though our inheritance of spirit is so vast. The quiet eternal that dwells in our souls is silent and subtle. In the activity of blessing, it emerges to embrace and to nurture us. Let us begin to learn how to bless one another. Whenever you give a blessing, a blessing returns to you. That's what was missing the first time I blessed an animal, light and reverence. Of course, it was done in a spirit of love and fun, which are not antithetical to blessing. But from this distant remove, I have a greater sense of how much I had to learn and still have to learn about blessing. And this morning, once again, the cycle of life as represented by the cycle of the planet's water has put a literal damper on our actual planned animal blessing today. Sorry, people who wanted to bring their animals to the labyrinth. We will have to do that another time. But we can all touch that generosity within our own hearts to bless all animals everywhere, as well as our own beloved companion animals. And shortly, I am going to share the blessing that I would have used at our blessing ceremony outdoors so you can hold it within your heart and share it with any animals you love when you get a chance. And I also want to take a moment today to think about, to praise and to honor and to bless the animals we maybe don't love or maybe even more precisely, the animals we don't even give our attention to. The animals that are out of sight, out of mind, 
one so tiny or so impossibly distant and remote from us that they never become a part of our consideration, no matter how vital they are. Nor is it a requirement for an animal to be vital, to be worthy of blessing. Right now, in a river somewhere in a land not currently inhabited by humans, there's a little tiny fish swimming unknown and unnoticed by us, possibly even by any other living creatures. That little fish is just as worthy of blessing as the fish that might live in your aquariums at home, as the fish that you might catch and release when you're relaxing by the lake, or the fish that might provide life-giving sustenance to you. And that's what I love about our reading today. Thank you again, Carol. It names all manner of animals, even worms and insects, that aren't often what come to mind when we think of blessing animals. Each creature in the world, no matter what we know or don't know or think or don't think about them, matters. In part, I say this because so much about life here on our own planet remains a mystery. A huge part of being human, for instance, relies on the existence of our own microfauna, the gut biome that is vital to human health made of trillions of tiny beings in symbiotic relationships with us in our own digestive tract. We've thought a lot about a tiny being indeed. I know there's some, there's some controversy over whether a virus is alive, but still, we've thought a lot about viruses, for instance, in the last few years. There are also countless tiny lives that perform functions not only beneficial to us, but necessary for us to survive and to thrive. I'll return our attention to this part of our reading. You worms of the earth, ants, beetles, spiders, and centipedes. You are the essential but oft-forgotten strand in nature's web. Through you, the cycle is complete. Through you, new life arises from old. Remind us of our humility, for the wheel of life does not turn around us. We are not the axle, but merely spokes no less than unseen, unknown, and shunned companions such as yourselves. We are not the axle, merely spokes. All life is vital, and none the less so for the shortcomings of our own understanding. All life is part of the cycle of life and death and rebirth that sustains all of us on the planet. Last week, I talked a little bit about the ways the living tradition of Unitarian Universalism re-examines periodically its own deepest values and the principles upon which our faith stands, acknowledging that all things that live must change. One idea that I have heard several times is a proposal to combine our first and seventh principles. The first principle, as a reminder, is that we affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. The seventh principle is that we affirm and promote respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we are a part. And so one way I've heard it framed to combine those two was we covenant to affirm, promote, and respect the inherent worth and dignity of the interdependent web of existence and all beings that live within it draws a circle from ourselves to everything, makes us larger, not the axle, but one of the spokes. When we acknowledge the many gifts and blessings we receive from animals, many of us think first and foremost, and most lovingly, of companion animals that share our lives and our homes, especially during the first years of the pandemic when isolation was its own endemic condition, animals gifted us with huge amounts of joy. Even if we didn't live with pets ourselves, we saw them in the background on Zoom calls with our friends, we watched videos of them on the internet, we smiled to watch our neighbors out walking their dogs who didn't even seem to notice that anything was amiss. And in the spirit of blessing, of the nurturing that flows from wells deep within us, I'm now going to share a few of the words of the blessing I would have let us in for companion animals that were brought to the grounds had we done that today. 
This blessing is adapted from a blessing originally written by the Reverend Laura Horton Ludwig. And we're going to do this today in the form of a brief guided meditation. So I invite you to get comfortable in your seats. Close your eyes or soften your focus and sit in silence for a moment before, actually, maybe bring to mind a, 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 a picture in your mind of a beloved animal, companion animal, a beloved farm animal, an animal that you just feel a connection with. Folks on Zoom, if your companion animal is nearby, Look at them, hold them if they'll tolerate it. We're going to sit in, mo in a, for just a moment in silence before we begin. Humans, let's breathe deeply. And place your hands gently on your heart. Imagine how love flows into you up from the earth, down from the stars, flowing easily into your heart until your heart is full. Now let that love spill over and flow into your hands until you feel them full of love too. Still breathing love into your heart and with your hands overflowing with love, place your hands on your animal friends if you are at home, or hold them out as you envision a beloved animal. Hold them out in front of you. And imagine your love flowing into them. Imagine all that love flowing into the animals that you love. Imagine it flowing into all the animals you don't yet know and that you may never know. And now there's going to be a repeat, and I'll ask you to repeat back so you have these words so that you can give them to your own animals at home. I bless you. I bless you. I love you. I thank you for being exactly who you are. May I be a blessing to you as you are a blessing to me. You can lower your hands. Thank you. And take a last few gentle breaths. I hope that you take the time to love and appreciate an animal today. And no matter what silliness they get up to, no matter how squirmy they get, may you give and receive the blessing of love for all of the richness of animal lives. May it be so.
This season is sometimes called the Days of Awe, um, or the High Holy Days in the Jewish calendar, the days between, Yom, um, between Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year, which is on the 24th, and ending uh, in the, on the evening of um, Yom Kippur on Wednesday evening. And during that time of the year, this is a time when uh, Jewish people make amends. Uh, Yom Kippur is the holiday of uh, atonement, or you know, saying sorry, um, but the amends that we make are with ourselves, with our community members, our families, our friends, um, the other people in our lives, and also with the Creator. Uh, it's a, a time of renewal. And this piece is called the Hashivenu, and it's the prayer that Jewish people sing when we're returning the Torah or the Bible back to the Ark, back to its its the place where it's stored when we're not reading from it. And the, the text, uh, the translation, a translation of the piece that we're about to do is, turn us back to you, O God, O creator, and we shall be renewed, or we shall be, our days shall be renewed as old. So, it's one for renewal. <laughs> Hashivenu, Hashivenu, Adonai Elecha. Thank 
you. Very rich. So many rich blessings that we bring together today from different traditions. Thank you for sharing this time with us. And we will be uh, extinguish, extinguishing the chalice. Please join us in extinguishing our chalice and your home chalices if you have them with the words that we have. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. We extinguish the child.